Um, I want to talk about power, justice, power. We care a lot about the one error. It's a thing that matters to us. We set our alphas, right? And we talked, we've talked about this before. We set it at 0.05, simply because of uh, Fisher and Yates and their discussions. Um, but we set that ourselves. Our software, in fact, gives us exact key values. So when you go into SPSS, which I hope some of you have played with, or you can do with Excel, um, you can use Google Sheets, right? And there's even online calculators you can play with, not a problem. It'll give you an exact key value, the probability of this being, of the null hypothesis being true. So it actually gives you these numbers. Um, so we get this idea that type 1 error is more important than type 2 error. Don't want any false positives. Right? Okay. So that's the sort of the notion we get. But really, we don't want to make any kind of errors. We also don't want to make two type 2 errors. Um, historically, all this stuff about Fisher and the null hypothesis, uh, Fisher actually thought that the null hypothesis was not a straw man, that it was a real thing that we were trying to reject. And of course, Fisher and Yates talking about the 0.05 level. Um, and that's not horribly important. It's just interesting to note that Fisher really thought of the null hypothesis not just being a straw man. Uh, which is what it is. It's, it's an argument we set up to destroy. Um, you might say, well, all of our methods are set up that way, but that's kind of that's what I'm looking for. A tautology. Why do we care about type 1 error? Because our methods are set to care about type 1 error. That's, that's kind of a tautology. In fact, that's almost definitionally a tautology. Um, I think it's probably this. It's easiest to set up a situation as straw man and all hypothesis where nothing happened. It's, easiest for us, it's easy for us to imagine there is no effect of a variable. So what we do is we set up this hypothesis where nothing happened, the null hypothesis. So I think it's partially that. In fact, I think it's a lot that. Because for the alternative hypothesis to, our hypothesis to be true, we actually have, not, not only have to know that something happened, but we have to know how big that something is. Question? No, you can. So you know, like if I say that there's no effect of um, our mythical IQ improvement course, I can easily imagine what the mean would be. Same before as after. But if I'm going to say that it works, how much does it work by? Is your IQ about five points, six points, nine points, eleven points? Drop by four. Oh, I have to say how big the effect is. I can't just say nothing happened. I have to say something happened and how big the something was. Hmm. See, so that's kind of a, it's a harder thing to do. And in fact, today, we're going to do this and we're going to, we're going to basically do statistics all ass backwards today. And that's okay, because to make these kind of power calculations, you have to make guesses like this. They're ridiculous in some respects. What you're going to do is say, how big are, uh, a difference are we interested in? Okay. But you do have to go backwards and say, let's pretend the effect is this size. And you can't. It's hard to do. So this might be a little tough to get your head around at times, so ask questions. OK. And speaking of which, any questions so far? In the best of all possible worlds, we would ma minimize alpha and beta, the probability of a type 1 and type 2 error, and have, therefore, because power is 1 minus beta, we get the most power we could. Yeah, that'd be good. We don't want to make false positives, we don't want to make false negatives, and we want to detect real effects. That's alpha, beta, and power. You want to find stuff if it's there, but you don't want to make it easy to yourself, basically. Okay? That'd be great. That seems like a reasonable, laudable goal. Right? Okay. Power 
is the probability of rejecting HO given HA is true? Now, no. This is a conditional probability. Do we ever actually know that HA is true? We actually can't know that. It is impossible to really know this. Right? You've got to keep that in mind. This is a, a theoretical exercise. This, it is impossible to know if HA is true. Um, that's stuff that we, that's reality. That's the, you know, there's like the, the statistical decision and is HO true or is HA true? But if we knew this, we wouldn't have done, have to do the experiment, right? So you actually can't really know this. This is, again, why this is difficult to get your head around. Because we have to, say, we have to try, try to calculate a probability of something we can't know. Dude. <laughs> How do you know that the red that you see is the same as the red that I see? See, when I'm high, I have discussions about probability. How do you know the <coughs> probability of rejecting a false null hypothesis if you can't know that HA is true? Dude. Oh, did I say it? No, I've never smoked marijuana in my life this week. So. So much you say. It'll be legal soon. We'll all be on in class. It'll be great. We'll all be going Trump's. President? <laughs> no way, man. <laughs> Might be the only way we all get through the next four years, but still! Um, so, do you see why this is something it's really hard to get your head around? Because how do we know this? We can't know it. So we have to make a guess at a probability. That's a weird thing. We can give you exact probabilities for alpha. We said it. Probability of a, of a, of a false... Uh, False positive of, of, of a type one error. We just say it's 0.05, and the math is set up that way. That's easy. This we can't do, really. It's hard. Okay? So you all understand why that's a difficult set of calculations to make. Okay. So here's a picture, and most of your pictures are worth at least a thousand words. Most of your top pictures. <coughs> So what do we have here? I've got, this is actually scanned directly from the book, where the book uses H1 instead of HA, but whatever. Here's our null hypothesis distribution. That's what we know of. We've set up the null hypothesis. So just ignore H1 for a second. If we get a value that's greater than this critical value here, that's a cutoff, we say we have an effect, don't we? Now, there's a possibility, however, that if this is true, we still are, so this is true, we still reject it. It's a very small probability. You see that? It's a small part of the tail is going to be 0 0.05 of the tail of, of the distribution, typically. So, so far, just ignore the other one for a second. You know that one because you remember that from 2126, right? The little tail part, that's alpha. That's the probability of a type 1 error. So the HO is true. HO is true, but we reject it anyway. We made a mistake. OK, you're OK so far. OK, then let's pretend H1 is true, HA is true. We can't know that. But let's pretend it's there, and let's pretend it's that size. And that's exactly the distribution. Again, that's not something we can really know. We still make the decision based on, th at this point, this is the probability, but let's say, so it's still at this point, but we, we, we find a number over here, we still don't reject HO. But remember, H sub 1 in that case, or HA, whatever you want to call it, is actually true. Hmm. Actually true. Now we've made a type 2 error. We've made a false negative. It really is the case, H1, that HO is false. But we said it was true. We didn't reject it. And then what's left, here's a real effect, H1, and here's where we make that decision. Everything to the right of alpha. That's the, the size of the power. So as you see, the probability of, big, of a type 
two air typically is much bigger than the probability of type one air. You look, you look confused. Are you okay? Yeah. You sure you're okay, or you're confused? Which one? Confused. A little bit. Okay, that's could have been a little bit of both. A little, little bit of both. Okay. Yeah. So let's go a little more deeply into this. Look at this here. H O H one. And just ignore. Let's go back actually like this. Let's ignore so you get H O. Let's pretend though that H1 is not here. You get that part. You all get this part. The little bit here for alpha. That makes sense, right? Because you all did that in 2126, right? Does they even make you drop pictures with your problems? Good for needing. Pictures are important. Okay. But sometimes, actually, in fact, we hope, this is actually true, not this. We, we hope, in fact, to find an effect. Why would we be doing it if we didn't want to find an effect? So we're hoping to reject HO. So what we do, let's say, and we, we, we would do that if we get a value from here or further on. There's a mistake. Look, we made a mistake, beta because it's to the left of our, what we call our critical value. That's a type 2 error. And then what's left over here is power, probability of rejecting a false null hypothesis. So basically what we want to do is make this small beta, make, well, this is already small alpha. It's already small, because we set it. So basically what we want to do is decrease the overlap between those two distributions, which we can't really do because we don't. This is why it's a weird thing. We can't actually do this. But let's pretend we could. How would you increase the power? Well, there's a couple of ways that immediately come to mind. You could make alpha bigger. What if we put alpha over here? Suddenly, this power part's way bigger. What if we moved alpha way over to the left? You could. Is that practical? No. Because that leads to too many false positives. And try explaining to a journal editor or your thesis supervisor that you want to set alpha at 0.15 and see what happens. Good luck with all that then. It's not going to work. It would work technically, but we can't do it. But technically, it would work. Pretending we had that kind of power. We could increase the difference between mu1 and mu0. What if we just put this distribution, instead of being on the screen, what if it was over here? Hey, they don't overlap at all. Woohoo! Look at all the power we've got. You can't do that. If I could move distributions in the population, people would be lining up on Sundays and worshiping me. Or Fridays or Saturdays, depending on the So, we can't do that either. That's like completely. We could do the thing with alpha, we just, it's impractical. This is literally impossible. It's mathematically a thing, but we couldn't really do it. Damn. Imagine if we had that kind of power. That wouldn't be statistical power, that'd be the power to move mountains. That'd be awesome. Like these would be mountains. That's the sound you make if you move mountains. Uh, you have to do that. I don't know why. So, <laughs> edited out some stuff there. Um, in my head, I, I never edit this the podcast. I would never edit. Well, I would if you if you said something you didn't want to mean. You know that. Aha! Uh -huh. What if we could decrease the variance? If we could make, we could tighten these two distributions up. Or a standard deviation. Now we can't really do that either. But the thing is, when we're making statistical decisions, are we using are we using the distribution of the variable? 
No, we're using the sampling distribution of the variable. Oh. There may be something we can do. So if we can start get less overlap, we may be in business. We may have something we can do. Do you see that? Like, if we tighten these two things up, they didn't overlap at all, we wouldn't, the power would, we would imagine the power. All the distributions are belong to us. Nobody, nothing, okay. <laughs> so we can probably do something with variance because we're not dealing with, oh, they didn't help up at once, oh. <laughs> We want to make the, the variances tighter. And remember, we're doing sampling distributions. Why do you think we mentioned, I mentioned central limit theorem last week, right? We're doing sampling distributions, and there is something we have control over. <laughs> because the sampling distribution of the mean as the variance of sigma squared over n. Oh, we can't do anything about sigma squared n. n, n is the number of subjects. So we can do something. We don't have to have magical powers. It's too bad. I wish magical powers would be good. I'm pro magical powers. Sigma squared sub x bar is a function of n, just increase n. Then there's less overlap. We don't need magic. And we don't have to change alpha. We can't change alpha because nobody will let us. We can't change the, the means because it's not a thing we can do. We don't have those kind of magical powers. However, we can change the variance. And we do that by collecting more data from more subjects. That's going to tighten up those sampling distributions where they overlap or not. Because the variance of x bar is sigma squared over n. Oh, I'm excited now. Less overlap, more power. Questions? OK. See, so this is good. So that's something, so practically we can do that. Now let's, let's just think about this, even if you don't even get that little bit of math there. Let's just say you don't even understand that bit of math. And that's fine if you don't. Because think about this. If there was a difference in the population. Now let's see, our population is this classroom. We got the left side of the room and the right side of the room. Just look, equal numbers. Let's pretend that, the left side of the room, my left, your right, for those of you scoring at home, <laughs> has an IQ that is five points higher than the right side. Sorry guys, I, I'm trying to explain to these guys, but they're you know, five points lower, they probably didn't get it. It's um, <laughs> a joke. Okay, but that's gonna be hard to detect five points, isn't it? So if I took four people and four people, I wouldn't find a difference. Wouldn't be too much overlap. And then if I could collect like six and six, maybe it's still probably pretty hard. But if I tested everybody, I'd have the population at that point, and then I definitely have the difference. I definitely find. Oh, so that's a, basically the higher n is, the closer you are to actually looking at the whole population. The question is, do you want to actually look at the whole population? No, you want to say, I want this many, but I don't need any more than that. Okay. You have to make a guess here. There's still guesses you have to make, and the thing is, how big an effect are you interested in? The new running joke, by the way, is the left side of the room is smarter than the right side of the room. It'll be the whole term, just like, you know. I'm sorry, guys, over there. <laughs> oh, I could be so mean, and it would be completely arbitrary and hilarious. Um, I won't be mean. 
people on the left side of the room, of course, want me to be mean because they're mean to people that are a little slower like you guys. Um, it's a joke. Okay, the effect size, that's the difference between two meets. Mu1 and mu0, or mu, or uh, AJ and HO, I'm gonna say that. So we said it was, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, IQ, we could also go with um, height, it could be different. Uh, it doesn't matter. We want to standardize it. How do we always standardize differences between means? Well, we divide by the standard deviation or the variance, right? So we're going to take mu1 minus mu0, we're going to divide by sigma. By the way, notice that we don't know any of these. <laughs> we can't. If we did, we wouldn't have to do the experiment. And we're going to call this difference D, D for difference. Why not? So D equals mu1 minus mu0, mu0 over sigma. Right now, we're thinking about this solely in terms of a one-sample t-test. It, 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 it applies to all other kinds of inferential procedures. But right now, that's what we're thinking about, the simplest case scenario. So, hmm. how big is big enough a difference to care about? Let's pretend that, in fact, Maybe there is a difference between the two sides. What if it's half an IQ point? Does that matter? Not that you can five, which it actually is. These guys don't get it. Um, even if it, even if it were five, five isn't that much. Now, if there really was a difference between the two sides of the room and their IQ, and it was 15 points, that's a standard deviation. That's, that's, that's something. I go, ooh, that's, that would be interesting. Even less, maybe 10 points. Oh, I wonder what that is. Maybe this half of the room is a lot of lead paint. You guys are licking the walls. I don't know. The wall lickers over here. <laughs> Wall liquors and the Einsteins. So it's uh, <laughs> wow. So many of these things really are just for me. When you guys laugh, it actually is just a bonus for me, and I appreciate it very much. Um, how are we going to determine how big the effect is going to be? Well, one way we can do it is prior research. You, when you just read old articles, and you say, how big a difference do they find? Okay. So you say, how big a difference? is typically found between the two groups or between one group and a mean. Okay? And that's a sensible approach. Assuming people have done decent science, you read the article. But for example, there's a difference between uh, there's a very small effect of levels of processing and priming in given thing. It's a small effect. It's so small in fact that people say levels of processing has no effect. But if you go back and read Chalice and Broadback 1992, <laughs> spoiler alert, there's a small effect. We were looking at this stuff, it's like everybody's finding this effect, but it's so small it's not significant. It's literally a 5% difference between <coughs> high level of processing and low in prime. That's very small. In fact, it's the point of almost being meaningless. I, I did a little meta analysis of 35 studies, found 31 of them found the same effects all in the same direction, just exceedingly small. It's to the point where it doesn't matter a great deal. It matters enough that I got a publication on it. But Like I said, if, let's say it's let's say it's even just one point different to make them feel good about themselves. It's only one point different between the two sides of the room and the IQ. Does that matter? No. No. Would we care? It wouldn't even really be interesting. It's a real effect, but who cares? It's that kind of thing. Our measurement is probably not good enough to care about it in that case. Like, we go, oh, there's probably enough error just in our measurement. 
So we have to kind of make a decision. How big an effect are we interested in? There's a difference between statistical significance and practical significance. So let's say that there really is an actual difference between the two sides over that cube, but it's only it's so small that it wouldn't matter. It's impractical, it doesn't matter. We wouldn't go looking around at maybe there's lead paint in the, in the side of the room and they like the walls because they're not that bright. I'll stop that sometime around the end of March. Next class, everybody's sitting over here. Um, so this is a good question. How big is big enough? Well, Cohen, ah, good old Cohen, says we, there are basically three kinds, this is a, ca a categorization, of differences. There's small, medium, and large. He just arbitrarily called them small, medium, and large. Say if D is 0.2, that's 85% overlap. Think about 85% overlap. That's almost the two distributions are on top of each other. We don't care about typically about something that's that small. Medium, even if it's a 0.5, it's still two thirds that overlap. That's a lot. Still a lot. And then large, even a large one, but 0.8 is still 53% overlap. 0.8 would be a uh, that would be 12 IQ point difference. Okay, that still means 53% overlap in the two distributions. <coughs> wow, wow. Hmm. So typically, you pick the middle because it's what people typically do. Like, yeah, I'm just interested in something in the middle. So now what? What do we do with this information? This truly fascinating information. We combine this information, the idea of how big an effect we're looking for, with the samples, the effect of sample size. And we get something called the delta statistic. No, that's not an eight written funny. That's a small Greek letter delta. So we combine the information with about the effect size with n, and we get something called a delta statistic. Delta equals d, that's the Cohen's D, that difference, times the effect of N, a function of N. What's the effect of N in the experiment, in the calculation, sorry? Mm -hmm. So what's the effect of N? So what you have to do then is look at the formula you, formula you are using and go from there. First day with the new lips. Probably they're not doing it. So f and n is how n is affected by a test. So for a t test, f and n is the square root of n. I couldn't, I didn't feel like getting at the uh, equation editor, so that looks like a check mark and a bar because that's what it is. But pretend it's a square root of sum. <laughs> I, I use the equation editor a lot more later, but I have to just—it's it, it's annoying. So for a t test, which is what we're going to work on here. You take a look at a t-test, you just look at the formula. Any old t-test will do. Oh, look, it's affected by the square root of n. So we use the way the f and n thing is going to be square root of n. Okay. At some point, what we're going to be able to do now is solve for n, which is cool. So it's actually not that bad. You just, the, the hard part of this is you're thinking backwards. You say, how big an effect will there be? I don't know, I'm not magic. Well, how big an effect are you interested in? Oh, let's go with a 0.5. So if you know D and you don't really know it, you just say, how much would I care? Would I care if it's 0.2? And now I wouldn't really care. My honor students always say to me when they say, how many subjects do I need for my experiment? 
and I say, I don't know, and I think about this, do a little calculation. Let's say 12 per group for analysis variance. They go, really? I say, well, yeah, you can get 40 to find something, but who would care? You're going to find differences. I guarantee you, as much as I can joke about the IQ thing, there's a significant difference between these two groups of people in uh, the size of their little toes. I guarantee you that's real. But who cares? It's uninteresting. Right? You can always find something. If there was a, a large effect, you different going to go, what? Only tall people on one side of the room? Or giant toad people? Giant toad people, which is a 50s movie about giant toads. But still, <laughs> Steve McQueen was in it, just after the blob. Anyone? Uh, OK, so let's say we know d is 0.5. We don't really know it, but we're going to think 0.5. And that's typically what you do for these power calculations. You usually take 0.5. Just that's what people tend to do. You don't have to. By the way, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, on, there are a lot of online calculators that are really good for doing this kind of stuff. So you put in what your D is going to be, your, and then you put in uh, what kind of statistics you're going to do, and then it tells you how many subjects you need per group. So it, this is not the kind of thing anymore that you need to really calculate a whole lot. Knowing how it works is good, but actually doing the calculation by hand, no one really does it by hand. Uh, what typically people do is they, there's, there's these online tools um, which are pretty reasonable. Like you can have these power functions. I had to, I've, got a I've got a textbook in my office, my graduate stats textbook, that has a whole appendix that's like 30 pages long. They're just, they're just graphs that you read about how many subjects you use. Now I can just go click, click, click on my phone. I, I don't do anything. I just go click, 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 and it tells me. I can just ask Siri. I wonder if I could. Hey Siri, how many subjects do I need to find the difference between two groups if, uh, I don't know, D is equal 0.5? See, I could actually freaking ask Siri. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the world's a bit different than it was when I was in graduate school. Back then we. The phones were attached to walls. It was weird. <laughs> okay, here's the other part that's a little odd. What power do we want? We have to say that in advance too. We go, well, you should use your alpha in advance of your stats. So 0 0.8 is a nice number. 80%. If I want an 80% chance that there's something there I can see it. Well, I, you know, I can't see a thing, but I'm going to find something. Use it just metaphorically. Don't be offensive with the blind jokes. So 0.8. By the way, most of you guys don't know me that well. I don't get offended by those things. I'm making fun of uh, people taking offense. I am not easily offended. It pisses me off. I don't see well sometimes, but for the most part, it doesn't offend me. <laughs> people say, oh, I'm sorry. It's like, what, are you my father and mother? Did you give me the bad genes? <laughs> don't be sorry. I did get on the bus once in the driver, and I was in a bad mood. I think I maybe have told some people the story. I was in a bad mood. And I got on the bus and I showed my bus pass because I have a special bus pass because I'm legally blind. And the driver said, well, I didn't see your pass. And I said, I've never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I said, was it your fault? And then he got really flustered. Um, the next time I saw him, I said, dude, I'm really, I shouldn't have done that. I was in a bad mood. I just came out of a really shitty meeting. I'm sorry. It was a fun moment, though. Yeah. Wasn't as good as the time I said that this one guy, have you ever had the shit kicked out of you by a blind man and showed him my, my CNIB? I didn't know what to do. <laughs> anyway, um, we want a power point eight. That's good. That's a nice, sensible number. If it's there, we're going to find 80% of the time. OK. We well, then, there's an appendix in your textbook called the appendix power. Um, and then you look up what you're going to get for delta. So this now becomes just using another table. Let me show you. So we're going to say d equals 0.5. 1 minus big data, that's the power, is going to be 0.8. Alpha is 0.05, because it's always going to be 0.05. And then you look up what delta is. Because if you can have these three things, 
Then you can look up what delta is. Now, there's the, the, the appendix. It doesn't look it's hard to see it with this light. There we go. Maybe we can see it now. I think. Let's see. So we've got D here, and we've got, there's your alpha level, right? So I'll just zoom in on this. Let's go back for a sec. Let's go back one. Oops. So again, D.5, 1 minus beta 0.8, alpha 0.05. And here's the table. There's the alpha. So we're going to go 0.05. We're going to go down this row. We've got D. Of where is it? 0 0.5. 0 0.5. Right about there. So we just read off this delta number. I'll show you. It's 2.8. Just looked it up. It's a lookup thing. You look up in table. So I'm going to go back again to show you. Just to make sure, okay? Where are we? I went back too far. Okay. 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 0 0.05. Appendix power, power is a function of delta and a significance level alpha. Alpha, 2.8, which is there. There's a power of 0.8 there. See? Power of 0.8 is there. Yeah. 0.8 is there. You read across. 2.8 is our delta. There's 0.8. There's 2.8. We just look at what power we want. That's what's in here. In the, the entries in the table with the power. It's 0.8 we care about. We then look over to the left until we find the number. The delta is 2.8. Okay. So now we have this. How did I get that? Uh, I cross multiplied. Also, it was square root of n, so I squared it, so I can get the whole n. So I got 2.8 divided by 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is the d. We got the delta. The, de uh, we got the, de 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 the delta. 2.8 over 0 0.5. We read from a table 2.8 because we knew the power of uh, sorry 2.8. We knew the power was 0.8. We knew 0 0.05. We look across. Go, oh yeah, 2.8. Done. Put that in there. Because remember, I'll show you how I got this, okay? Because are you confused how I got this? That n equals delta over d squared? Yeah, you are? No. No? So we need 31 subjects. Yeah. yeah. That's all it is. 0.6, 36. Yeah, so 0.32. And <laughs> just be sure, because unless you can find 0.36 people. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to go over how where this comes from? Yes. Yeah. Because Remember delta, which is a fun thing to draw, equals n times, sorry, square root of n times d, right? Well, I don't want, first of all, I want that isolated, right? So I'm going to go square root of n equals delta, oops. <laughs> Delta over D, but square root of N, that's no fun. So I'm going to square both sides. There. Nothing fits. That's where that comes from. It's just, it's not magic or anything. A lot of discussion of magic today. So. Basically, all this is doing, and that's those power calculators online are doing, they're just looking this up for you and doing this quick calculation. Now, what if we want, what if we increase the power? 
Let's maybe instead of put in point 0.8, point 0.99, we really want to find it. So now what you do is you go to that table and you go 0 0.05 for alpha, point, and then you look for the entry for 0.99 for delta. Suddenly, it's 4.20, <laughs> 420. So, <laughs> suddenly it takes us 71 people to get a power. 0.99 versus 0.8, so we increase the power about 25%. Yet we more than doubled the number of subjects. Doesn't seem to be like it was probably worth it. Doesn't seem like it was worth it, really. Oh, you'll find something now if it's there. But now you're suddenly testing twice as many people or rats or whatever, or chickadees. Hmm. You need a lot more data. That's, that's a lot more work and a lot more money. I mean, you got to understand something. Science doesn't happen for free. And it's interesting because you see this a lot with political polls, right? You see that People who don't understand polling will say, well, this poll had 3,000 respondents and this one had 1,500. The one with 3,000 is going to be twice as good. No, really, it's not. It's going to be about 25% better. It wasn't really worth it if we already found the difference. Probably not. So again, all you do you got 0 0.05, you know D, that's going to go back into the calculation. Then you look at the power, you look at the power you want entering the table under the 0 0.05, usually 0 0.05, and then you just go all the way over to the left until you find the delta that you get. Okay? That's all you're doing. What the hell is delta? Delta is the non centrality parameter. I don't know why I said it like that, but it felt good. You know, we always assume HO. In fact, when we do this, we assume HO is true. And then it gives us a probability of HO not being true. Or sorry, of HO being true. If it's really small, we reject HO. Um, so under HO, the expected value of T is 0. If HO is actually true, we should find a T value of 0. Should we? Because that should be x bar. x bar minus mu should be 0. If we did the experiment over and over and over again, there's going to be sampling error, but over and over and over again, the expected value, long term running average, it should be zero. So all the non centrality parameter is, is we say it's basically the same as t, but saying it's this, the difference is d big, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, whatever. How likely is it that we'll find a value of delta in this case then, which is greater than the critical value for t, 2.05. So it's actually this. If you ever wanted to calculate it, which, why would you? But this is actually how the values are calculated that are in the table. You don't have to ever do that because you have tables. All I'm saying is that this is actually done. So delta equals x bar minus b over s divided by root n, which is not equal to zero. The only reason that slides there is because people, every couple of years, someone goes, well, what is Delta sign? I read so often there's a weird geeky kid that was like me. I think I told you guys in my second year stats class at Western, the whole time I was like a toddler. Yeah, but why? So the real take home message is that you can do power calculations. And in fact, you don't even have to do the calculations anymore. You really can just, not that that was a hard calculation. You look, so everything comes from a table, and then you divided something by itself, or by something else, right? That's not that hard. 
But you don't really even have to do that because there's so many nice online calculators now. And after you've done experiments long enough, you start to get a feel for how much, how many subjects do I need? And one of the things that happens, and this will happen to a lot of you guys, how many people here are planning on doing thesis next year? Okay, we're chunky, that's nice. So yeah, you know, you know what you're gonna do, even though you just heard this, you're gonna talk to your advisor and say, how many subjects do I need? And he or she's gonna say, I don't know, let's see. 20? 30, and you're going to go, oh, I wanted to get 80 in each group. And he or she's going to look at you and go, why? Why? If you need 80 people to just find some marginally significant effect, who cares? You want something that's robust, right? You don't need it. Look, you've got to find something if you would test enough people. You really are. But who cares? Doesn't matter. Right. And it's the extra time and effort you put in. You guys will find this out soon. Samantha is in the thesis right now, and she knows that. Are you running subjects yet? I'm sorry, testing participants? <laughs> Another week or so. Okay. You're going to find out shortly that it's a lot of work. <laughs> and uh, when you think with the extra, you know, the law of diminishing marginal return, every single extra one you get doesn't actually give you that much more information. Like you saw, getting from a power of 0.8 to a power of 0.99, we tested more than twice as many people. Was that worth it? Probably not. It's kind of crazy, actually. But I do. Right? So that's a, it's just something to care about and something to think about. And it's easy to do this. Like Doing that other math before, it's weird to think about. What would AJ be? How big would it be? That's a weird sort of set of thinking to do. But the nice thing is they have these nice online calculators now. It's not that hard to do. Any questions about this stuff? All right. Um, good stuff. <laughs>